Hello, Gabriel here, coming at you with the top 10 tips for players struggling to win in Wild Frost. That's right. So this guide is not going to be an advanced guide, I would say. It's more just for uh, either newer players or people that just aren't quite getting things to click with Wild Frost. Um, it's definitely a game that can be a little overwhelming or daunting at first, especially if you're new to the genre. Uh, so, kind of put together 10 things that I think could help most players in your situation to maybe start to get things to click a little bit. Uh, there should be chapter markers below, so if there's anything you're particularly interested in, feel free to skip around. Um, and yeah, I mean, the way I would use this guide, if you're a player in this type of situation, is just go through the tips, and if you find yourself not doing them, give them a shot. Maybe it'll help you, maybe it won't. I think it will help you. Um, not to give you an argument from experience, or whatever you want to call it, but I will say I, uh, you know, I'm able to win almost every run these days, so... It's definitely not a game that's impossible, uh, but definitely I lost a lot when I started out. So there was a lot of growing pains, and hopefully, hopefully these tips can make you not have to go through as many of those growing pains that I went through. So without further ado, let's get to the first tip here. Buy crowns often. This might be one you've already heard. Uh, if that's the case, then go ahead and just skip on through, but if not, then you're really missing out. Um, you really need to be planning to get these crowns uh, as much as you can on runs. Uh, that's going to be 80 gold every time at the Woolly Snail Shop. So you want to try to get into those shops uh, with 80 gold. Um, I'll have some other kind of tips related to gold along the way, but uh, you know, they're so powerful that as a baseline, when I go to these shops, I really look at the crown, and that's going to be my first option. I have to have a really, really good justification to be taking a card over the crown if I can only afford one or the other. Um, and the reasons the crowns are so powerful is uh, not only are you getting these cards just guaranteed at the start of the battle, but you essentially are playing them for free, right? You play them out, and it doesn't uh, count down the countdown or it doesn't tick down the countdown on any of the enemy units so you just get a really huge advantage at the start of the fight the more and more of these crowns you have and you can start to put together um, pretty nutty stuff eventually I generally recommend you put it on your units your companions first but maybe toward the end of a run when you start to get some powerful spells that might have some charms on them then you can start playing around with putting the crowns on the the cards instead of the units if it makes sense. Uh, and you know, on that note, just know that once you put a crown on a card, you can always take it back off of it and put it onto another card. And you probably should be doing that at least at some point in the run. So yeah, I mean, this this I put this as tip one because honestly, it's the most powerful thing. It's a very simple tip. But if you're not doing it, then you're just handicapping yourself pointlessly. Uh, the crowns are incredibly powerful. Probably the single most powerful map event in the game is the Woolly Snail, in my opinion, simply because you can get a crown. Alright, on to the next tip here. Greed is good. Now, I've seen a few criticisms of just what it takes to, to do well in... Uh, in Wild Frost, and one of the one of the things that comes up often is like uh, basically min maxing a fight to get as much gold as possible. Kind of gets criticized, and uh, I kind of would counter that with you don't really need to get a gigantic amount of gold, but you should try to get gold when you can. Um, and it's not like it's necessarily easy to do. Like, this is a skill you're going to kind of have to develop over time. Um, so, and there's really two parts of it, right? There's the combo kills, so that's killing two or more enemies at once. 
that's going to give you significantly more gold than if you just killed one at a time. And the more you can combo, the more, the better it is. I mean, it's, it's literally the j difference between making, like, 50 gold versus 100 gold in a fight if you can get big combos. And of course, there's a goblin, which uh, you probably want to put snow on if you can. But that's where the, the skill comes in, right? It's determining, can I throw a snow on this goblin and still win the fight or not? To me, uh, if I compare it to two other really popular deck building roguelites, Slay the Spire and Mountain Monster Train, to me, this is uh, these sort of uh, greed components in Wadfrost are the equivalent of like fighting an elite in Slay the Spire or taking a trial in Monster Train. Uh, it's really the you're you're adding a little bit of extra challenge to yourself in order to to get some benefit uh, in your actual deck building in the next few fights, right? So that's kind of the determination you need to make. Can I stall out some enemies and line up my my hits such that I can get a combo? And can I, you know, waste a few moves just throwing stuff at Goblin, whether it be snow or even something like, you know, I've, I have Junk listed here, which does zero damage. Anything that hits but does zero damage is going to be a great thing to throw at the Goblin, because then you don't kill it, um, but you can keep just getting gold on it. Um, and yeah, like I said, you, even like 30 or, you know, a, a bad fight is probably going to be 30 or 40 gold. Uh, apparently I said 100 god, but that's supposed to say 100 gold. We'll just, we'll just roll with it. But yeah, you can get 100 or more gold if, you, if you're if you playing your cards right. Uh, pun somewhat intended there, I guess. Uh, a great fight to fra uh, practice in is that first fight, though. What I will say is... The earlier the fights are, the more simple the mechanics are with what you have to deal with with enemies. So you can get away, especially as a newer player, um, trying to greet out those that first fight in particular, especially if you end up fighting against the penguins. There's going to be a 50% chance to either fight them or just the other guys. Um, but especially if you get the penguins, really try to line up those combos. It's super easy to do in that fight. And you should be trying to do it as much as possible. It's, it's you can get uh, 90 to 120 gold if you do it. Uh, just very simple combos. Now later on in the game, uh, it's less important, I would say. You know, once you get to the fifth, sixth, seventh fight, um, combo if you can, but don't throw a run, especially as a new player, uh, just to get that extra gold. Because at that point in the game, your deck has kind of come together. Um, it's really the early fights that you want to be getting, uh, paying special attention to trying to get that extra money on. But yeah, definitely, you know, don't, don't try to like, I see a lot of, I, I, I see it uh, when a player says like, oh, you know, it's just, all you got to do to win is, um, you know, do a bunch of combos or stall the gobbling out a bunch. I see that as kind of a rationalization because um, I doubt those players that complain about that. You know, it's usually people that aren't winning that make that complaint. I guarantee you they can't actually do this properly. Um, I guarantee you they either try it and they throw, or they just don't do it all together and complain that they can't win. You're going to have to find a happy medium with being able to figure out how much you can get out of a particular fight. You know, you got to gauge the strength of your deck um, or just how good it is into a particular fight. You can have a good deck that's bad into a particular fight, right? These are things you're just going to have to kind of to ask yourself and then see yeah, see if you can greet out a bit, bit of gold. Um, I mean, if we go back to uh, the first point, you know, that's the difference between getting a crown or not, and that's huge if you can get that extra gold. And the third one is move, move, move. Uh, this is a very unique game, I find, in how... Uh, liberal it is with allowing you to move your units around um, you know if you've played other similar type of games like monster train you just you know you have to usually spend a resource to do something like that but in this game you can reposition your units as long as they're not as long as there's not a special effect on the board like hog-headed right but 
Uh, Hog-headed, you can still re reposition them, you just can't recall them, but you really need to be repositioning units quite often. Um, if you're just um, putting them down and letting them sit there, then you're really not playing Wild Frost, in my opinion. Uh, and it's no wonder you're struggling. Um, you need to be thinking both about offense and defense. Uh, it's often pretty good to spread the damage across uh, you know, your units evenly. Uh, as long as there's not a whole lot of enemy barrage. But uh, even beyond that, like, there's just... Uh, you really don't want to take more damage than you have to. I mean, I have a porcupine listed here that has a barrage. Uh, you generally want to only have it hit one unit. So if you're playing four units, it's pretty common for me to run maybe four units. Um, try to just have one unit get hit by it. That way you're not getting two or more uh, units just sort of pointlessly hit. And similarly, a unit like Bigfoot who has aimless, keep in mind aimless, is still contained to the road. Um, so you can still kind of control what it's going to hit. Similarly, if you can just have only one unit in that row, then Bigfoot is guaranteed to hit it. And Bigfoot does a lot of damage, so generally you want to give it maybe like a, a clunker or something like that. Or just a unit you don't care about taking a ton of damage from. And uh, also, um, you know, I briefly talked about recalling. Recalling is when you just take your unit and then throw it to your discard pile. So you can drag any unit as long as they're not hog-headed. That's a keyword. Um, a keyword that prevents this, but as long as they're not hog-headed, as long as they're not a summon, uh, you can drag them down to the bottom right. You can even do it with clunkers. It won't heal a clunker, but um, if it's a unit, like Taiga here is a very common one for me to do this with, because he's typically just taking a bunch of hits in order to deal his damage out. Once he starts to get low on the health, you can take him. And you don't want your units, or you don't want your units to get injured if you can help it, right? If they die, they get injured. So, um, if you drag him out to the bottom right, they'll heal for five HP or whatever it is. Pretty sure it's five HP, and then they'll be in your discard pile, and you'll be able to redraw it and play it again, and it'll have more health. Also, any debuffs will clear. You'll notice um, Taga has. Uh, two frost here not that it matters on this unit, but if it did matter I could uh, clear it just simply by recalling it and when I put it back in It'll be fresh Funny thing is your buffs don't uh, Go away the only one that does is spice. I don't know why that is but like these teeth for example He's gained up to six teeth here those stay those will come back when you bring it in so if you're not recalling Again, very similar to the above point, I just don't think you're playing Wild Frost correctly. Um, you're, it's a huge advantage to do it, and you should definitely be doing it. Uh, another thing to think about with that is you can try to time it. If you, if you need that unit back, um, you can generally time it such that you'll get it back pretty quick. What I generally like to do is recall them on a turn where I don't have anything in my draw pile. So, you know, if it's an empty draw pile or a, maybe like two or three cards in the draw pile, you're going to redraw your deck once you hit the bell. So that's a good time to recall a unit because you're decently likely that you're going to redraw that unit, depending on your deck size. And even if you don't redraw it that turn, you'll almost certainly redraw it the turn after. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is your deck size just isn't that gigantic in Wild Frost. And... Uh, you can really use that to your advantage quite a lot of the time. You generally draw about half your deck per uh, per set of cards in any given draw. Uh, so, and then yeah, you you also you, you got to think about offense as well. You don't want to uh, you don't want to waste damage. Like I used Wallop and Snuffle here as an example. So Snuffle is um, he's this guy floating on a cloud that applies one snow to all the enemies and then wallop is a guy who does a lot of extra damage to unit if they already have snow so if you can help it you really want to have snuffle attack first and apply that snow so that you'll actually get the extra damage with um wallop that seems simple right but in practice 
even I to this day still screw that up a lot. So it's something that you really need to you need to recognize when you're not doing it and kind of I don't know what the opposite of pat yourself on the back is, but what are the whatever the opposite of the um, you know pat yourself on the back is like scold yourself. You wanna you wanna scold yourself and tell yourself you're not gonna do that next time because the more and more times you do that the more and more power you're just randomly throwing away and giving the enemy a chance to beat you when you could have just done a way better turn there. And then control the fight. You know, there's a lot of tools um, to control the enemies in this game. Probably more than I've ever seen in a in a rogue building or a card, bleh, a deck building roguelike. I knew I'd get there eventually. Um, but yeah, snow is probably the one we start with here. It's uh, going to be present in every starting deck, and there's quite a lot of units and items. I think of items as spells, but I guess item is the proper term. It's basically a card, you know, that it does something. Uh, there's just a lot of snow cards, and you definitely don't want to neglect them. Uh, never underestimate how much you need. Um, there are, yes, there are certain enemies that are snow resistant, but it still is somewhat effective on them. Uh, but beyond that, the ones that aren't snow resistant, you can really lock them down with snow. Uh, I did also mention though, you know, not all snow cards are necessarily created equal, right? Not all of them are snow cake, where it just basically deletes the unit from the fight. But some of the others are only applying maybe two or even one snow per play and in those cases you're not really locking the enemy down all the time you're just sort of delaying their turn and you do want to be careful there that you're not accidentally making all the enemies attack at once because that is guaranteed to be a horrible turn possibly a game losing turn so really pay attention to the counters particularly when you're using the smaller amounts of snow type cards think like the uh the snow dwellers they get kind of the starting card that only applies to snow you really want to pay attention um, before you click that button make sure you understand what you're doing when you apply that snow if you're if you're applying snow to a unit that you're not going to be able to finish off by the time they attack then you really need to start thinking about um, the consequences of delaying that unit it might not actually help you in some cases and then Frost, this is one I think most players neglect in my experience. I've just kind of paid attention to like tier lists and whatnot. I, I never see, there's only a few cards that apply Frost, but they never really get much love. I personally think they're pretty good. I wouldn't give them like an S tier rating or anything, but I try to snag at least one in any deck if I can. You know, there's the one that gives two Frost, the Frost Bell or whatever, to all the enemies. And there's also the Frost Bloom, which gives three to one enemy. And I actually prefer that one to the AoE one, for what it's worth. But, um, you know, as I said above, there are enemies that are snow resistant, and snow isn't necessarily amazing against them. I have this uh, guy over here listed. You know, this is a guy that uh, basically does three damage to all of your units, and he is snow resistant. So the most snow you can ever apply at any given time is just one. But Frost can just basically shut his entire attack down. You know, if you do three Frost, he literally does zero damage. Even two Frost just makes him do one damage instead of three damage to all your units. And that's a pretty big uh, benefit. And there's plenty of other units where Frost just is really good like that on. You know, if there's an enemy that has Barrage or an enemy that has Frenzy, they generally don't necessarily have a whole lot of attack, but most of their damage just comes in the form of applying that base attack value multiple times well if you reduce their b base attack value then you're essentially reducing it multiple times in those type of cases keep in mind uh, a frenzy attack will make every single attack at that frosted value so if they have three attack um, and they attack five times and you reduce it by three it will literally do zero damage it's not going to just only do zero once and then do three four times right then we have Haze. This is more of uh, specific to the um, the Clunk Master group, but uh, it's uh, it's different than Frost, which is a little confusing. 
Um, but uh, as I noted above, if a friend's unit had frost, the frost would apply to every one of their attack. That's unfortunately not the case with haze. With haze, only the f only uh, you know the first attack, or if you have multiple stacks of haze, you know however many stacks of haze you have, every single attack they do with a frenzy will eat the haze up. So that's something you want to keep in mind. I have thrown runs before against something like a King Moko because I thought that all of five of his attacks or whatever were gonna be confused, but nope, it's only the first one. <laughs> so it's still fine though. It, uh, I think similarly to, similarly to Frost, I feel like people kind of underrate Haze. Um, it's quite literally uh, removing an entire attack sequence from unit in most cases, as long as they're not a frenzy unit. Uh, and if it's not a frenzy unit, not only is it removing their attack sequence, but it's uh, possibly taking out another enemy all at once, because then they're going to attack them if you happen to get it on a unit that does a lot of damage, especially like a barrage unit is a great one to put it on. They're going to really mess their own stuff up. And it's a great, it can be a great counter to stuff like uh, Krunker and stuff like that. Stuff bosses that just have these huge attacks. It just shuts them down entirely. And then, uh, Ink, another Clunk Master exclusive. There's a reason they're generally considered the best clan, but Ink is, in my opinion, the strongest debuff in this game. Um, never underestimate it. There's only a few ways to apply it, but I mean, you are guaranteed at least this card here, right, in your opener when you're a Clunk Master. And if you can get a Bink, I highly recommend getting it. Uh, it'd be hard for me to take any other card over a Bink if I don't already have a Bink. You can also find a charm that applies it, um, and that's really some of the only ways to apply it, but that's fine. Um, it's such a powerful effect that if you if you can make use of it, you should. It literally shuts basically everything in the game down other than Frenzy, or just a uh, unit you know, that has really big base stats. You know, all these ma nasty effects, like people that enchant things with teeth, people that make all of your units aimless, people that gain a bunch of attack every time they hit, ink just completely shuts all that down. So if you aren't using ink, uh, you definitely should be, at least if you're a clunk master clan. Um, and then chunk blocking, I didn't, I don't know if this necessarily fits control the fight, but it's something I thought I'd throw in here. here. Um, you know, a lot of these clans also have uh, a lot of ways to just sacrifice units that aren't going to negatively affect you that much. And that's what we call chunk blocking. So think of like the Junjun mask here that summons the, the three health unit or whatever that's default in the Shade Master clan. Uh, that's a great one for just soaking up a giant hit that otherwise would like kill one of your companions. And there's no real overkill in this game. Um, so you never have to worry about like some sort of trample effect and obviously clunkers are great for it too you know they they could do 50 damage to you it's only gonna take away one scrap at the end of the day uh, and yeah basically any summon any clunk master is a prime target for chump blocking uh, you really want to avoid getting your units injured if you can. Um, it, it'll happen though. It's rare I go through a run without getting at least a few injuries. Um, so on that note too, just because it's a companion doesn't mean it can't also kind of serve the chunk block rule. It's pretty common for me to have like a spike for example. If I have spike as my pet, he'll probably end up injured several points during a, during a run. It's just unavoidable. Uh, or, you know, going back to the greed is good point, sometimes I just purposely do it because I know it's going to earn me a lot of gold on that turn. And another thing here is, I guess, I, I, yeah, just identifying the threats. Um, not all the enemies are created equally. Generally, in any given fight, there's going to be one or two enemies that are the true problems for you. And who those enemies are will change depending on your situation, right? Your deck might just handle certain things easier than others, but, you know, I listed a few here that come to mind, like 
Uh, you got this dude that just does a ton of damage if, uh, if he still has a bunch of acorn left. So, generally, like, in this fight, we'll call it the acorn fight, um, this is a unit you really probably want to be keeping an eye on the most. You know, it's the unit you want to focus your snow on, your ink if you have it, um, your damage if you can do it, and, you, you know, having chump blockers preserved for eating a hit from them all of those things, like basically all of your attention needs to go to the units that actually are the true threats. Uh, same with this guy, this guy's, this little berry dude is similar to the acorn dude. Um, he's gonna do a lot of damage if you don't deal with him. Um, dealing with him can be anything, basically the same ways you deal with this unit are kind of the same ways you deal with that unit. Then you got a unit like Makoko here that gains one attack every single time it attacks. So. That's a unit that can definitely end your run if you're not uh, paying special mind to it. Like, it should really take the priority over the rest of that board in those fights. Uh, things such as snow, silence, or just putting, like, a unit that has teeth against him so that he keeps ramming into it. All of those are good ways to deal with that unit. And kind of so on and so forth. Really just, you know, beyond what's pictured here, try to have an understanding of what is the scariest thing on the board and make that your priority in the fight um, you know if there this little puff guy here generally has two health unless you get unlucky with a uh, charm on it but uh, it's an easy one to deal with but it's also an easy one to lose to if you don't identify that it is your immediate threat that you have to deal with most of the time like if you have uh, well, you know, you, these usually accompany like a multi-striking enemy, a frenzy enemy that can strike three times. And this unit will strike three different times if you allow either of them to kind of not be dealt with. So just really try to think of what's, um, what's the threat here. And Grink, for example, not that I want you to underestimate Grink, but that can be an example of a unit you just don't really have to deal with compared to the other ones. So... In the same way you want to identify what is threatening, you also want to identify what's not threatening and just sort of live with that unit being there for a little bit while you let your other stuff kind of uh, let the other targets be focused on. Um, now beyond identifying what the threats are, <clears throat> a big thing here is looking at your hand. Once you've identified the threat, right, now you need to look at your hand and say, can I even deal with it? And if you can, try to go down the list of threats and try to plan out a few turns ahead, right? You can't just think one turn ahead in this game. You often have to think two or three turns ahead. Because it is very predictable what's going to happen in Wild Frost. You just have to think about it. So even if you have an answer to one of the threats, you might not have an answer to all of them. Um, and you need to determine what the best course of action is. Maybe... In some cases, you have something that is so, so awful that it just has to be dealt with. And in those cases, don't be afraid. You know you have your redraw bell in the bottom right. Do not be afraid to click it early. You may just have to pass your turn to make sure you draw into the actual answer that you have for a card. And you can you can tell, right? You know, if, you're, if your redraw bell is at three and the enemy counter is at three, and you have no snow and you have no way to deal with it and you've kind of identified that card is going to kill you then you need to hit that redraw bell maybe you can play a card before it if you think one of those cards deals with another threat in the meantime but definitely you're going to have to draw before that thing hits zero on its counter it's going to wreck you right so then we have on that similar note redraw bell dinging um this is something that's just going to come with experience, but it's something you need to start thinking about. Uh, if all of your, if, if the only thing you're doing every game is letting the redraw bell go down to zero so that you get a free redraw and that's the only way you play, you're not playing Wild Frost. You know, there's just going to be turns where you do not draw what you need and it's better for you to just redraw. Um... You know, 
and using some of these cards as examples, snow is obviously a, a very straightforward example, right? You either have, have snow or you don't. In some enemies, the only way to deal with them is going to be snow. If you need snow, then you need to redraw for it. You can't just start playing out all, all the other cards. You can if they deal with enough threats in the board, by the way, but that's just the, that this is the tough thing to give a, give a one-size-fits-all answer to. Um, the best thing I can say is you need, you need to make a judgment call. You need to say, do I absolutely need the snow and I'm going to lose if I don't? Then you hit that bell. If not, then maybe you can get away with playing out your hand and then redrawing once it's free. These are just the things you're going to have to determine for yourself. Uh, and, you know, beyond snow, also like a chump blocker would be another example. You know, there's a lot of enemies in the game that might do 10 or more damage, right? And if they're about to attack in two or three turns and you don't have a chump blocker or some other way to deal with it, then again, you're going to have to think about hitting that redraw bell before it hits zero. Whether you do it now or a turn from now, that's also something you need to determine. If you have a critical card in your hand that you can't afford not to play to deal with another threat threat, for example, then you need to do that and then redraw. Um, and, and, you know, similarly, even when you get down to the free redraw, I think generally it's a good idea to redraw when it's free, but that's not always the case. Um, sometimes you may just have still say say you still have like seven cards in your draw pile and the only answer you have to a particular threat is still in your hand then you probably need to play that out before you redraw even if you're down to zero on your redraw counter a good example of that might just be like uh say uh say the frost card right say that you have a enemy that is gonna barrage you for three and you're just not gonna be able to deal with it um, that could be a prime time to just play that frost card because you know you're not going to be able to draw it in the next hand. And then we really need to know what's coming. Um, you know, I kind of tried to research uh, the most common complaints I get from people that just struggle and kind of leave bad Steam reviews or whatever in the game, right? Or just complain on Reddit or Discord or whatever, and a big one that they complain about is that they built a deck and had no way of knowing what was coming up, and it just wrecked them. Well, there's an element of truth to that, but I don't buy it. Uh, the reason I say that is every single fight in this game is somewhat predictable. Um, what I mean by that is there's a 50%, there, there's only two possible encounters every single fight along the way. You know, the first fight is either the penguins or the other fight, right? The second fight is either the berries or the other fight, so on and so forth. So you don't have a 100% certainty to know what's coming up, but you do have a 50% certainty to know what's coming up at any given fight. So it's not like you can't prepare for what's coming. You just have to have a you just have to know a range of what might come, right? And that range is literally only two different fights, right? So you can prepare accordingly, uh, depending on what you think would be the worst fight for you, right? You can pick up answers. Now, <clears throat> I can outline a few of these. Um, and also, you know, just on that point, if you find yourself losing to a particular group or boss or whatnot, often, Take note of which combat that comes up in, right? It always comes up at the same point in each run. And make sure you're prepared for it next time, if that's the one that keeps beating you. Overcompensate for it. You're still learning and trying to get your first win or your first set of wins, right? Um, don't be afraid to overcompensate. And you can scale back later after you've kind of got more comfortable with beating that particular fight, right? Now... Let me know in the comments if a more in-depth guide on this particular um, aspect of the game would be useful. It's a lot of work for me to, to do every single one of these fights, but I would absolutely do it if there's enough interest. Um, but I've just, I, I, instead what I've done is I've only outlined a few particular enemies just to give some examples here of things I look out for. So I know uh, generally, on the third fight, 
technically it can happen on the fourth, fourth fight as well, but it's less of a threat at that point. But on the third fight in particular, I have a 50% chance of facing Makoko. So having some answers ready for that, if I can find them before then, is something I need to prepare for, right? Um, and I just have, granted, there's, there's going to be more possible answers than I've listed here. These are just to give you some ideas. Teeth would be one. As I said before, he starts out at zero attack. He attacks every single turn, gains one attack every time he attacks. Well, if you just have a unit like Spike or Taiga uh, just sitting there taking his hits, uh, he does have eight health, but he will quickly start losing that health, and maybe you can just finish him with an item or an attack, and he just won't grow out of control. The main thing with Makoko is you don't want him to grow out of control. Uh, also, you can simply just snow the unit so that he can't attack, and therefore he can't gain stats. Uh, same with Ink, you're basically just taking away his effect. Similar to, similar, bleh, similarly to Teeth, Smackback would be good against Makoko for the same reasons that Teeth is good, right? He's just attacking you often, he can return the favor. Uh, then on the fourth fight, I don't find the fourth fight, the enemies, that threatening, but I do find Makoko can be uh, a bit of a tough boss. So you know you have a 50% chance to face Makoko once you're at the fourth combat. So you need to have a few options. Now, I I gave a different icon here for Snow because technically Makoko is frost resistant, but that doesn't mean that Snow isn't bad. Or that doesn't mean Snow isn't still good against him. The thing is you just need a lot of Snow application and you need to keep playing it a lot. That's one answer to it. Um, but another answer could just simply be attacking him a bunch, whether that's with units or your items or a combination of them. Generally, this is some combo of these two things is how you're going to deal with Makoko. I don't recommend letting the dude attack you. It's pretty hard to survive a King Moko, or not Makoko, King Moko. A King Moko attack is very hard to survive. Granted, there is an achievement that's definitely worth getting. Um, but I would only do that once and just plan on killing him before he gets his first set of attacks in otherwise. Um, so, you know, now let's think of this in terms of if I was going through the game, you know, the first, second, third combat, maybe by the time the second or third combat um, rolls around, I can start thinking about King Moko, right? But especially after I'm done with the third combat, it's crunch time to think about it. And... Let's say I haven't gone through the map yet, right? My third combat is done. I know I have a 50% chance of facing King Moko. Let's say I look at my deck and I determine I don't really have like a bunch of snow cards. Maybe I only have one, so I can't like repeatedly snow lock him. And maybe I only have like a card like Spike and Taiga two cards that don't attack, they just sit there and gain spikes, uh, I could probably determine that, well, I have a 50% chance here that I'm going to have a pretty miserable time against King Moko. I'm probably already okay into the other fight, but King Moko, I'm going to struggle in. So what I need to do then is I need to recognize that fact before I go through the map. I'm going to have two choices on where I can go in the map, right? So I know I need answers, so I need to add cards. Whatever path allows me to add more cards is the path I need to go. I need to pick up either a unit that attacks or hopefully some cards that can attack. A great example of a card would be the Slapcracker card. That's the card that does uh, one damage four times randomly in a row. That can be a great one against King Moko. You know, you basically, you just want to hit him over and over again so that all of your units gain a ton of attack and just finish him off fastly. And uh, then you got the fifth fight. In general, I think the fifth fight is never going to be that easy for you. Fifth fight is, at least at the time of me making this video, I think they're going to patch some of this out because it is, it is pretty tough, admittedly. But... Um, no matter which fight you roll, in the fifth fight, you're going to have things that you need to have answers for. Uh, luckily, a lot of those 
answers kind of are somewhat similar. Uh, if you're Clunk Masters, it's just ink. You'll notice ink basically counters almost everything. It doesn't really counter King Moko, but... Uh, so the, you got this cat here, the cat that basically has something similar to Smackback. It's actually even more oppressive than Smackback, though, because it, uh, it attacks in the row it's at, so it can catch you by surprise. The best way you're going to be able to deal with this, other than ink, is just snow. Because it's not snow resistant, and you can snow it. If it's snowed, it won't be able to strike you back. So it's definitely worth picking up some extra snow into this fight if you think you're light on snow. Otherwise, it could be tough to deal with this unit. This boss, I should say. And then you got this fight, which I think I hate. And so this cat is going to be paired with this unit. I probably should have ordered those together. But anyway, um, the Wooly Drek and the Bigfoot I have here together because generally the Wooly Drek will eventually eat a Bigfoot, so it becomes just a you know, a more annoying version of Bigfoot, and, uh, really, I'm, I'm just, those are the two units that I'm gonna need to be worried about in that fight, so, um, at any rate, I definitely want, hopefully, some way to chump luck, because Wooly Drek is snow resistant, snow can work against Bigfoot, but it's not gonna be that effective against the Wooly Drek, and, in either case, that's a giant, you know, Bigfoot does 7 damage aimless. The Wooly Drek can get up to like 20 damage or more aimless usually. So you need either some clunkers or some summons to hopefully just put on those rows when those attacks come in to eat up the hit. There's just too much damage to be relying on your companions to just take those hits. Um, if you can deal with that, you can deal with this fight. It's a very tough fight, but... If you can deal with those hits, there's not much else that is actually that bad in this fight. The boss is pretty easy. I listed Spice here, but really what this rep represents is also another viable option. It's just simply having so much offense that these guys never get a chance to get off the ground running. I don't, at least the way I build decks, I rarely am able to get enough offense to actually kill Wooly Drek before he gets out of control though. Usually I'm just weathering the storm with Wooly, with the Wooly Drek. So, realistically, most runs, I think you just need to be prepared to weather the storm. And then I also listed this guy here, which is the guy that applies teeth to all the people. Um, if he's in his own row, he's generally not a problem. The time he's a problem is when he happens to spawn into the same row as another unit. And if that's the case, you know, all your guys are aimless, assuming you don't have ink and it can be a real problem to kill this guy in a, in a reasonable amount of time that you don't just run all your guys in a bunch of teeth. So I kind of listed this uh, this proto cannon here. This is a cannon that does 8 damage, but you can, you can basically treat this as any sort of item that does a lot of damage, right? Any item that you can add that just kind of does damage. The, the Azul Axe would be another decent option. Basically you want to have a targeted spell, targeted item I should say, that can take this unit out. Um, if you don't have one, I'd try to pick one up going into this fight, or else you could possibly get wrecked. And then in the sixth fight, uh, you're either going to face the tree or you're going to face Krunker. I don't typically find the tree is that tough, uh, but Krunker can be, like particularly if you don't have snow. Like if you don't have a bunch of snow. Um, He's going to do a lot of damage depending on the RNG of where his targets are. Uh, now, not every run is going to give you snow, so you need to think of other answers if it doesn't seem snow is coming your way. And similar to King Moko, another answer is to simply hit the unit a ton. Uh, you can rush this unit down, or this boss down. He only has 8 scrap, so as long as you can get 8 hits in before he gets too many volleys off, hopefully you can do it before... You know, maybe just one volley is it. Uh, maybe you can even do it before he even gets his first volley off, right? If you're really fortunate. The second phase really isn't that hard in my opinion. So if you don't have enough snow, I would just try to um, rush the dude down, basically. Rush him down with spells, usually, because the, the units aren't typically going to be able to hit him because there's some pretty beefy stuff in front of him, usually. But definitely something like a Snapcrackers and whatnot could make short work of this 
boss. And then a uh, this sort of turtle that applies haze to your units. Or I guess it's not whatever it is, a crab, hermit crab, I guess. Um, the seventh fight. I don't find the other fight is particularly hard, the one with the the warhogs and whatnot, but this fight can be a real pain if you're not prepared for it. So and really it's, in my opinion, because of this unit here, the one that applies haze. So if you have a unit that doesn't attack, like Spike or Taiga, they're going to be a great counter to this, because they don't care if they're hazed, right? They can just take the hit, and it doesn't matter. Uh, also, a unit like Vesta, as long as you don't somehow accidentally put Overburn on your units, uh, Vesta is going to be also a unit that if they get hazed, it really doesn't hurt you that much. Yeah, it will make it so she doesn't attack the enemy, but also uh, zero damage to your unit that doesn't already have overburn is not that bad of a deal. Uh, also this uh, Shade Wisp, that's basically the um, card that copies uh, the enemy uh, at 1 HP. This or any, any summon really that just has 1 HP is going to be a decent option there too. You just summon it, it immediately dies. You don't have to worry about the haze killing your stuff. Um, for about the first portion of this fight, also you can technically just take a hit with a guy as long as they're not about to attack and then recall them because that'll get rid of the haze. The th I, I wouldn't rely on that though as your answer because the thing with this battle is once the boss comes in, it applies hog-headed to all of your units, and so you can no longer recall them. And if that's the way you planned on dealing with this unit, and you didn't, uh, you know, that boss comes in and there's still a few of these left, you're gonna just have a miserable time. I'd much rather see you have some card like Spike or whatever in your deck. Um, and of course, Ink. As with most things, Ink just destroys it. Like I said, there's a lot of other units and stuff I could do, but that would probably be its own guide at that point. If that's something you think would be useful, just let me know. I'm not going to make it unless there's, like, significant, uh, demand for it, because it's going to be a lot of work to do that guide. But I could see it being useful. Um, and then eight, slow down. Uh, I can honestly boil almost all my losses down to just me playing too fast or carelessly. Uh, every time I lose, it's really nobody's fault but my own. Um, I didn't see something. You know, there's a lot of surprise gotchas in this game, and that's, that's how you lose. You don't really lose, in my opinion, from, from unfair stuff. I think the game is actually quite fair. It's unforgiving, I'll admit that. But, technically, all the information is there. There's a few mechanics that are a little bit unintuitive, I'll admit, but, you know, you're only allowed to lose to that a few times before you can start blaming yourself, right? Because you know it, after a while, what the mechanic is. You just simply played too fast and didn't think about it. But, you know, before you play a card, right, anytime you play a card, or if you hit the redraw bell early, it's going to trigger the turn to play out, right? Generally, you should ask yourself a few things before you do either of those actions. You know, is, are there any enemies about to attack? Uh, if there are, understand if they're going to kill any of your units, um, especially if you're putting a unit down that displaces your units, make sure that you're not accidentally like putting a unit into a new row now. You know, if you have three units in a row and you want to put a new unit into that row, it's going to push some other unit out, right? Make sure you're not accidentally pushing it into like a Bigfoot or something that's about to attack, or a barrage unit that's about to attack. Um, are any of your units going to be attacking into spikes or smackback? You know, you don't want to, and I say spikes here, I mean teeth, sorry, monster train. Uh, Old habits die hard, I guess. Teeth. Teeth or smack back. That's another easy way to accidentally die, especially if you got a frenzy unit, especially if that unit's aimless. You know, really need to make sure you're not just accidentally letting your unit kill itself. 
uh, especially on that cat too. We talked about that cat boss. If that cat is not frosted or that uh, not snowed, sorry, then you really, really need to double check every turn and make sure nothing is accidentally attacking it. Um, or even uh, if you have aimless units, I would especially slow everything down. I generally think aimless units are good, but they can be the death of you if you're not paying attention. Uh, aimless can be a benefit for you, the same as it is a benefit for the enemy. You know, it's one of the. It's it's not barrage, but it'll do in a lot of cases. Like it's just one of the only ways to get to the back line sometimes. Um, also, uh, just ask yourself: Is the play I'm about to do? really solving anything or am I just playing a card because it feels good right sounds dumb but honestly I think even I do this a lot of the time right it's like I'm playing a card because I'm on autopilot probably good to stop and ask yourself if there's a better play at that point right because there's only so many times you play a card in any given fight and every play counts you know you don't want to just mess around and let the enemy start continue to kind of go through their motions without actually disabling them or buffing one of your guys properly. You know, don't just put a summon down just to put a summon down, for example. Um, and yeah, do I, do I actually understand the full implications of what's about to happen? You know, think about the me mechanics of everything on board, especially if it's a mechanic that kind of is troublesome for you a lot of the time. Uh, teeth would be a big one. Um, aimless. Uh, haze. Especially the enemy hazing you. Or uh, hitting a unit that gains teeth or gains something. There's a lot of units that uh, when you hit them, they'll gain an effect. And that could accidentally put them... You know, that might give them enough teeth to actually be the difference between you living if you wouldn't hit them or dying since you did accidentally hit them with like a spell or something so definitely need to like slow down and and also like you know the turn order at least to me the way my brain works is not actually intuitive um like when you look at this board um can you off the top of your head just tell me who who attacks like first, second, third, so on and so forth. Because in my brain, you know, I know the enemy attacks before me, um, but, and I know generally, you know, it's gonna be the units in the front that attack first. But beyond that is where it gets unintuitive, in my opinion. I know it now, but when I first started the game, this caught me by surprise all the time. For me, I would think that Truffle obviously attacks first, but I would actually think. Like, um, let, let's say that, uh, let's imagine every unit had the same counter, right? So the, the truffle down here also is at a 1. I would assume that the porcupine attacks next, but actually the truffle would attack next. So this is actually the turn orders as they happen. Now, of course, you know, um, counters trump everything, but in a world where all the counters were the same, this is the order it would go. So this unit goes, then it goes to this row. So it doesn't stay in the row, right? It goes this, this, then that, then that, so on and so forth. Same with your side. And that can really mess you up if you, uh, if you aren't expecting things to attack the way that you're actually, you know, planning your turn out to do. And you can only blame yourself. You can yell at the game, say that it's stupid that it is in that order, but at the end of the day, you knew it. You know it now. If you didn't know it then, you know it now. And uh, it's it's your fault. It's my fault. And then nine, cover your weak spots. Um, this is something that's universal, I think, to a lot of card games, but I think it especially applies here. I'll often see people just taking the card that is quote-unquote better, you know, if you, if you looked at a tier list and you see a card and you see these cards that people kind of rank as S or A tier, like, okay, I'm just going to only pick these cards all the time, right? That's a great way to just throw your runs. As we've said before, there's a 50% chance 
to know, or there's a 50% chance either troop comes up at any given top uh, combat. And if you just keep adding, like, you know, the cool cards that give you a bunch of spice or do a bunch of spore or give you a bunch of frenzy and you neglect adding some extra snow cards or a frost card or a card like Azul Axe that can sort of snipe out an enemy uh, without your unit actually having to attack it in a lot of cases, you know, so on and so forth. If you're, if you're just always taking the most powerful card, regardless of what your weaknesses are, you're probably going to lose. You know, I think the deck building aspect of this game is downplayed a lot. Um, yes, it's not, you know, deck building isn't the huge focus of this game as it is with a lot of the other games in the genre, but it's still something that's important. And if you're not covering your weaknesses, then you'll get exposed in a lot of those fights and there will actually be no way you can navigate the fight to beat it. So, you know, this globe card that in my head, I don't think it's like that amazing of a card but I take it a lot. Same with the Frost card. They aren't like amazing cards in a vacuum, but they're absolutely going to save your life in so many of these awful fights. Uh, they're going to be a great answer, and you probably would want them over just another card that just does powerful things, but powerful things that you're kind of already, already might have covered in your deck already. Like, and don't think you just have to go all in on one archetype, right? I think that's another problem, too. Like, if you start with a few overburn cards, now you're thinking, oh, I'm just going to only add overburn cards now. You don't really need to. You only need a few cards to make any given synergy viable, right? I could have just an Azul Battle X, and I don't need to add any other overburn cards, right? It's a good enough card on its own. I could add... A unit that applies spore damage and I don't need to fill my deck with a bunch of spore cards right sometimes it might make sense to but the cards are gonna do what they do regardless of you just uh, kind of stacking whatever particular synergy that is you know you hear a concept win more a lot and you really want to think like am I adding a win more card here uh, win more is kind of the concept of well, I'm already winning a particular fight with my deck I already have. If I add this card, it'll just make me win against the same combats that I'm already winning against. It'll just make me win them harder. Whereas, I could pick another card that actually covers me in a fight that I'm not winning, right? In a fight that I'm behind on. I want a card that can get me back into that fight, right? Or answer, in a, an answer a threat that I can't currently answer and yeah I mean similar to one of the, that earlier chart we had kind of out list, listing what I view as common threats at any particular fight think of those threats especially if you've recently lost to them and if you're at like a shop where you have a, or a card draft you have a bunch of choices of different cards really Look, you know, open your deck a lot. You don't need to make the choice right away. Just open your deck, look what you have, look at what you lack, and is there anything there that actually covers what you lack and could help you in that fight that you might potentially be weak against? And then uh, we have uh, the final tip here uh, practice patience with charms. Uh, and this is, you know, this is not a gigantic thing, but I think people misplay this a lot. Uh, it's just human nature, right? Like, you get a charm and you want to immediately put it on, but you don't have to, right? You can keep them for however long in a run. Uh, not saying it's incorrect to always put them in, but gen generally, you know, especially if I get a charm at the first node, on a map sequence and I still have more to go like I have maybe a unit to pick still and maybe a shop to to go through there's really no point in putting that charm on anything right now um, you might as well see what additional companion you're getting and maybe that charm better fits that unit right um, or you go to a shop and you get like a slap crackers that can make use of something some sort of charm right or an AOE card 
and uh, so that's that's the simple uh, way to pa practice patience with charm but then there's also kind of the next level patience with charms which would be to not even equip it at all going into the next battle um, those again is kind of hard to give a one-size-fits-all answer to when you should do that or not but a few questions you can kind of ask yourself for in that case are do I feel like my deck like does my deck suck like am I behind and I need any little help I can get just to push me over that threshold of winning and losing if that's the case sure apl apply a charm that isn't necessarily great right now uh, or also you know, do I think that this thing could give me a bunch of gold, right? Like this, for instance, this uh, this skull charm, you might find a better unit to put it on in the future, but you could also just put it on a unit that you plan on dying right now and do a AoE damage to the whole row and get you a bunch of gold. That's perfectly fine just to put the charm in right then. But then like this penguin charm is one I often just don't put in because it's like I'm probably not going to get much value when I first get it but then later in a run it might make more sense what could actually benefit from it like a, probably the best example I could give would be the Van Jun card which is the card that starts with one attack only and it gives its attack to all of your summons well you could do the penguin charm and then like put a frost or put snow on the unit and even though it's snowed, it's giving a giant benefit to all your summons, right? Because now, however much snow you apply, you're getting an attack to every one of your summons. So, definitely try to practice a little bit of patience there. Um, if you find yourself just always blasting out your charms, um, if it's not giving you a huge benefit to put it on right now, you might think about just holding it. Obviously, if it gives you a big benefit, you might as well put it down, right? But it's not that beneficial consider just keeping it on the keychain for a few fights until it might materialize into something broken and oh that's right I did say 10 and I lied there's 11 tips here this one's more just just a little bit of a, a little bit of tough love maybe a little bit of mental support here uh, or not mental support but uh like support for you getting in the right mental the right mentality state for playing this game um you know i i i, I thought i'd open this with my favorite steam review of the game i think uh it says having cleared the true ending of the game i have come to the conclusion that the average steam user would call a crosswalk unbalanced because they tried to cross the street when the light was red and got hit by a car and uh I can't agree more. I can't agree more than I do with this. Um, as I said before, yes, game is unforgiving, but it's absolutely fair, I would say. Uh, future patches will probably rebalance a few things, but like if you're blaming your losses on balance, if you're blaming your losses on RNG, you're just being weak. This, this, is my, this is my moment of tough love. You're being weak, and you're just not correct. Um, I am no savant at this game. I am nothing special, and I can win almost every run these days. Uh, there are no unwinnable runs in this game. That's, that, that's just not a thing. Especially if you're not even at the max difficulty. You know, I'm playing at the max difficulty, um, and still able to do this fine, and like I said, I'm nothing special. So... You know, this is kind of touching a lot of the earlier points, but you really need to learn from your losses. Uh, I guarantee you, in 90, probably 90 to 95% of the time, you lost because you played too fast. Or didn't understand a mechanic, which kind of, they go hand in hand, to be honest. But, that's honestly most of the time. Like, it's, it's usually you, you didn't think the, th the turn through. I mean, this game is not on a timer, unless you're trying to do a speed run. Uh, you owe it to yourself to think through these turns, especially if it's a tough turn, right? Uh, but don't underestimate what you think is an easy turn either. Like, especially in my early time playing, I threw away a lot of stupid uh, runs. Or threw away a lot of runs and some really stupid mistakes. 
I almost lost more when the going was easy than when the going was tough. Because I thought I didn't have to consider many things, but... Like, if, uh, if you haven't scanned the entire battlefield and seen everything that the enemies are doing, everything that your guys are doing, and you haven't scanned your deck and you're hitting end turn, you're probably messing up. You're probably messing up. If you didn't mess up that turn, you're setting out yourself up to fail in a future turn, probably. And also, as we mentioned, if it wasn't uh, playing too fast, then you probably just built your deck such that it never had a chance to win, right? You know, you, you might have a spice deck going and you're like, ooh, I can double my spice and I already have spice. Clearly, I must take this, right? Uh, by the way, that's what this icon is here. It's a card that doubles your spice if you weren't aware. But let's see, you had no other snow in your deck other than your starting snow card and you're about to go into a fight where you need snow and you passed up on a snow globe to just add more spice to your deck then you messed up you made yourself you know really powerful but you know say we're going into the seventh fight there and half the units have like eight barrier on them or eight block I guess doesn't matter how much spice you have but if you don't have any snow to stop those crabs that do eight damage then you're gonna be in a very tough spot um, and also, you just didn't navigate the fight properly. You know, you didn't na you didn't uh, you didn't understand that Makoko is like the biggest threat in that fight, or you didn't understand that this tortoise or hermit crab that plays Haze is usually the biggest threat in that fight. And as I said before, stop blaming RNG. You are the reason you lost. I am the reason I lost. As I said before, every time I lost, yes, I probably will naturally want to blame RNG or whatever. I can't blame you for wanting to blame RNG, but if you're really trying to get better, if you really want to win at a higher rate or win at all, you owe it to yourself to stop blaming RNG because the fact of the matter is it wasn't RNG's fault. It was your fault. And maybe in some rare cases, some rare cases, I'll concede that it was a bug, particularly the berry blade. But most likely it wasn't a bug. Most likely it was you. So sorry to give a little bit of tough love there, but I think it just kind of needed to be said. Uh, this game has a lot of mixed reviews from people that just don't understand uh, deck building roguelites, in my opinion. You know, they're saying the game is unbalanced. They're saying the game is unbeatable most of the time and it's just flat out wrong you know you couldn't win um you, you couldn't go on like 10 plus streaks uh if that were the case but anyway i hope this was useful whether it was or wasn't i'd like to hear back uh and i can calibrate recalibrate as such for the next time i want to do a similar guide like this um, but I do ask that you're at least the target audience, right? If you're already well versed in this game, obviously this guide wasn't really for you. Um, this guide was for the people kind of struggling. So I want to hear from the people that went into this guide struggling. Play with it for a bit. Use the tips. If they actually allowed you to win, I'd love to hear it. But I'd also love to hear it if you, you used them and you still find yourself losing. Um, and, you know ask ask away ask a question on if you're still losing and still stumped let me know and i can maybe you know I'll, I'll directly address hopefully something in the comments but i'll also just have an idea for maybe a future version of the guide that might be better right if i'm missing anything here anyway as always thanks for watching and until next time